everybody. We're so excited to be here today. I, we have a ton of new people on the call here today. So if you haven't been to a Trefera coffee and convo, welcome, welcome. We're so glad you found your way to us. Just a little bit of a background on us. Trefera, at Trefera, we are a reseller of education technology, and we're super passionate about the ways that schools use technology to transform the learning experience. And our Coffee and Combo series is a way for us to sit down with thought leaders in education and amazing people like Holly Clark to talk about how to use technology tools to change the way that we're teaching and our students are learning. So we're super excited for today. I have a couple housekeeping things before we get started. And they're kind of boring, so bear with me. The first <laughs> If you do want to get that coffee, it's a $5 Starbucks gift card. I know a lot of people are here for that and love that. If you want that, you will have needed to register with a valid school email address. So whatever that would be, minnesota.k12.edu or whatever that is, you would, would have needed to register with your school email address. That's our way of just kind of making sure that we can continue to support the educators that hop onto these calls rather than people that just come here for the coffee. So thank you very much for your patience with that. And then the second part of getting your coffee, you needed, oh, sorry, you will need to stick around to the end to do the exit survey. There are seven questions, doesn't take very long at all, gives us a little bit of information on you and gives you a chance to let us know how we can best follow up with you after the call. So it's super, super helpful for us. Make sure you take that survey at the end, otherwise you won't qualify for the coffee. Great, check. Second housekeeping item. If you have questions throughout the session, feel free to put them in the chat. If you don't know how to enter the chat, there is a very obvious talk bubble icon on the bottom bar. So you can click into that. I will keep an eye on that throughout the session. Anna will keep an eye on that throughout the session. And Holly, as much as possible, will also, but we'll get your questions to our speakers as we go. And we'll also have time to hit anything that maybe we didn't get to during the session at the end. Also, one more thing. We do have our friend from Trefera, John Hill, who's kind of our Google guy who's on the call. If you have logistical questions about Google licensing or Google tools specifically, we do have him on the call. So if you have questions, we can flag them down and get some answers for you as well. So that is all of the stuff that I have. I will pass it on over to Hannah to kind of, or Anna to kick us off. Great. Thanks, yeah. Uh -huh. Anna Hanrahan. It's, you know, the H's and the A's get, uh -huh. get, get crossed with one another for sure. But thanks, Kate. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here today. I'm so excited to be here and hosting this webinar with Holly. And I'm Anna. I'm one of our teaching and learning consultants here at Trefera. And I'm part of a larger team of former educators, and all of us have close to two decades uh, working and teaching in schools. And, you know, it's a really cool position we're in because our mission is really just to help empower teachers with knowledge and skills to integrate technology into their teaching practices. So we provide support, resources, guidance, just to help teachers with their confidence in navigating this just ever-changing field in education technology. But when I was in the classroom, I taught for about 20 years and I had my ear to the ground all the time. And there were a few educators that I would just routinely follow and gather inspiration from them. And now working in this field, I've been lucky enough to cross paths with some of the best of the best in ed tech mm -hmm. thought leadership. So I am so excited to have one of my personal inspirations here with us today. So I'd like to welcome Holly Clark here. She is a seasoned educator turned best-selling author uh, Holly has 25 plus years in the classroom and she helped pioneer one-to-one -one teaching models back in 1999. So not trying to age you, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> and she has yeah. been at the forefront of merging technology with education in just really truly meaningful ways. She's a national board certified teacher, a teacher of the year at both the, at the city, county, and state levels. And she is on a mission to empower fellow educators to harness blended learning and unravel the potential potential of AI in their classrooms. So she's also a well-respected author. She wrote the Google Infused Classroom and the Chromebook Infused Classroom. And her latest book, The AI Infused Classroom, is just chock full of insights and practical strategies for both educators and students. 
And so I highly recommend you check that out as well. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Holly and thanks for being here today, Holly. Thank you. And um, on my view, I can only see three other people besides us. And one of them is the superintendent that I talked to yesterday about AI. So hi, Aaron. Um, it's kind of funny that you're one of the three people that I can see. Um, and so I, um, I'm going to get started in really kind of talking about the difference that we're seeing with Gemini in compared to some of our other AI tools. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that people are uh, looking at. So our, our agenda today is really the introduction, the key considerations, the Gemini in Google Workspace, um, additional uh, googly AI tools and things uh, to consider. And I know some of you have seen some of these before because uh, some of you, I, I recognize your uh, names and I've seen you at my call and things like that. So some of this may be, in fact, uh, a repeat for you, but it'll get you into that AI expert field. So we're just going to start with a little video from Google about what they're doing with AI that's a little bit different. So we'll watch this really quickly. Advancing education with AI. Hi, Google. These days, we can all see how AI is revolutionizing the way we live, work, and imagine our future. At Google, we've been preparing for this for quite some time. Nearly a decade ago, we began working to develop and harness the power of AI to help everyone gain an understanding of its potential. We also formulated our own set of principles for applying AI responsibly. Many of our products and services use AI to help people connect more easily with the information they seek and with each other. And we're helping to expedite breakthroughs in fields ranging from healthcare to communication where AI has the potential to improve billions of lives. Today, AI has the power to transform education like never before. Taking what we've learned through years of building classroom technology and working alongside educators from around the world, we're developing AI in ways that will serve as an insightful tool, a thought partner that elevates educators as the heart and soul of the educational experience and supercharges productivity for educational leaders. With AI applied in the context of our educational tools, educators can choreograph learning experiences more effectively and efficiently. Creating lessons and presentations can take minutes instead of hours. Dashboards can reveal real-time insights into each student's progress and even their process, all of which gives educators more time to invest in their students and in themselves. For students, AI can help make learning more personal with tools that offer real-time feedback to help supplement the educator's instruction. It can help improve reading proficiency, and if students struggle, educators can be alerted sooner of the need for personalized attention. AI can also help unlock creativity, freeing students to reimagine the limits of what's possible. And that's only where we are today. Imagine a future where lessons are adaptable to each student's unique learning style. Accessibility features enable a fully inclusive classroom and AI continues to learn and develop ways to help both students and educators realize their fullest potential. This is the future of education. And as we move forward, um, I want to say I've, I looked at the chat during that video and I see we have Tara from Chicago and she's a Google champion and we probably have other Google champions. So if um, if you are know something about uh, any of this stuff that you want to add that I don't get a chance to cover, please put it in the chat and let's all learn together. And it's good to see some of you all here Um Anyway, so we're going to look at Gemini today, and one of the things that's been really interesting for me about Gemini is I'm going to admit, when Gemini was first coming out, and at the time it was called Bard, I kind of was like, eh, I don't really, I'm all chat GPT. And recently, when they rebranded and went Gemini, I really started to say, huh, there's something special here. And the other day I was presenting in Singapore and we did this kind of challenge, which was the AI expert challenge. And I asked questions about AI and they had to either use Google search, Gemini, ChatGPT, or um, Anthropic, so Claude. And we, we wanted to see who had the best answer, the one that was most understandable, the one that was presented most uh, friendliest. And um, Gemini won and it won by a hands down margin. And I really was shocked personally because I thought uh, ChatGPT would win. And so we're going to take a look at um, Gemini right now. 
And we're going to look at some of the things that it can do. Gemini is also placing itself inside of our workspace. And it's also doing it inside of our um, our personal accounts as well. So you're going to start to see some of this pop up from help me write in your email to uh, rephrase this in your Google Docs. And that's the kind of stuff that we're going to look at. So I'm going to go to Gemini and I'm going to go to my um, personal account here. And oops, give me one second. I think it's at Amazon right now. So I apologize. Everybody has um, that a, a couple tabs back. Yeah. <laughs> So hopefully you see it right here. And I'm using Gemini Advanced. And I'm doing that because I want you to see maybe there's a difference between uh, your free version and my advanced. Advanced is costing me $20 a month. I think I got it for the first two months for free. So I still may be getting it free. But I wanted to take a whirl into the advanced uh, features. And what it gives you is it gives you access to what they're calling Ultra 1.0. And um, just a little bit more of a sophisticated answer. Same thing with ChatGPT. But Gemini is doing it in ways, like I said, that are super interesting. So I'm going to ask Gemini a question down here. I put the prompt in the same way that I would uh, in ChatGPT. And one of the things that I'm starting to see in the chatters with AI is that we're going to be less about prompt engineering in the future. As we start to go to customize bots and we start to... Um, create things that are specially answering questions, maybe about science or maybe about language arts. We'll see less prompt engineering. So right now I'm going to just ask a question. Um, and so I'm not really prompt engineering here. What are the top 10 things I should know about climate change? And um, I want you to see how it produces the answer, what you think of the friendliness, I'm calling it, of what it does. But there are some really interesting things that Gemini does that I think caused it to be the winner in Singapore. So um, it tells us it's happening and humans are the main cause. OK, thanks. But um, and it gives us kind of a breakdown. Now, when I come to the bottom, this is where it really gets interesting for me and where I do think it wins over other um, chat GBT mo or uh, LLM models uh, uh, like ChatGPT. So down here, I have these, I can modify the response. And this is kind of like tones. I can change the tone. I can shorten what it gives me. I can make it longer. And I can't do that in other ones unless I prompt it to do so. I can um, make it simpler. I can make it more casual. That's kind of fun when you're having it write something for you. I could also have it make it more professional, but I'm pretty happy with its response right now. Um, I can share it in using the um, advanced feature that will probably be available in all workspaces soon. Um, and that I don't know, Google does its thing. Um, but I can export it to docs if I like this. I can uh, send a draft in an email if I found some important information on what I'm working on, or I can just share it. This becomes really important because if I share this, I can show my teacher the conversation I was having with this um, large language model. And I can have, um, I can kind of show them the things that I was looking for and idea generation and whatever. But here's the thing that's the game changer for me. If I come down here to this G for Google, it will look at Google and it will tell you where all of this information came from, citing sources that you can look up. That's a game changer for me. So where I see the highlighted version right here, I can use this drop down arrow. And I can see this came from uh, climate.gov, which it's a .gov account. I mean, it depends what you think of your government, but I think it's a pretty reputable source. So I can see that. Not only can I see that, kids can see that. And I think that's really important because this begins the research process. And we don't have anything like this quite yet in other in other. Um, models that we're using. So I'm really, really fond of Gemini for that alone. Where I don't see it um, highlighted, that means it can't verify it. That really helps me with bias and misinformation then, because I can see. Now, some of the sources that it might give me, and, and this is a, a great source, so I'm trying to find a bad source. Uh, um, I don't know this source as um off the top of my head. So then I can click on it. I can go look around. I can have my students do those digital literacy skills for how do I validate this site? How do I decide if it's a reputable source? And so now I have somewhere to start. And I think that's a game changer. 
Um, I haven't clicked on these three dots in a while. I just wanted to see what they did. Uh, and of course, in Gemini Advanced, I can also ask for a um, an image. So I'm going to say, create an image of climate change uh, in a desert. And now I don't know what it's going to do. We always know that we never know what's going to happen. But I just wanted you to see that inside of Gemini, we also have the ability to create images like in ChatGPT where we have a Dolly 3. Um, well, I really like this because it's coming up with four. One of the things I love about images here is I can just uh, scroll over it and I can download it and it's gonna download to the top of my um, Chrome browser. So I think this is pretty exciting and I'd love to know what you guys think about the ability to double check the information using a Google search. I think that's a game changer. And you um, might there's not. There's a couple of questions yeah. about that. Sorry. Um, one of them you. was Is this it. feature only available for the paid Gemini Advance? And I think that they're referring to the, the sources. Google. Right. No, it's actually on the free version too. Yeah. And let's just confirm that. Let's go to my free version. And so I'm going to come over here because I don't want to give wrong information. So I'm going to go to Gemini, type in the same thing. I'm going to use. So when I go to Gemini, by the way, I'm going to Gemini.Google.com. Google always has that kind of naming structure, sheets.Google.com or forms.Google.com, docs.Google.com. So they're keeping with the same thing here. And I'm going to say, what are the top 10 things I should know about climate change? Sorry, uh, I just want to make sure that. I'm giving you the right information. And you'll notice that I don't need to say act as a, geogra uh, a geologist, an expert geologist with an audience. So those kind of prompting things that we were talking about in the beginning of this kind of uh, AI revolution are really moving, we're moving away from them. And what we're going to want to do in the same way that we did with Google searches is we're going to need to know the information we need to ask. Maybe we need to ask specifics about um, certain parts of climate change, and we're going to need to do a little research so we ask the right prompting questions rather than thinking, act as an expert and whatever, That those are gone. Um, and here I can do the Google. Let's see if it works. I'm pretty sure it does, but I wanted to yeah, we have that. a few people chiming in saying it does on the free yeah, version as yeah. well. Um, so there we yeah. go. In fact, it even gave me more. One thing that I think we've all run into at this point is that no matter if I ask the question and or you ask the question, I'm going to get different results every time. And I am... Um, and even when I ask the question from the advanced, that one should be a little bit more powerful. But uh, let's look at the first one and see if it's close. It's happening and humans are the cause. So... I don't know how different it is. And I think that's kind of fun. Maybe we're getting a very similar uh, language model. Okay. Another so, question yeah. real quick with this was somebody asked if you had tested Gemini, the paid version of Gemini against the paid versions of Claude and ChatGPT. Um, I have. And um, <laughs> this is a Google for education uh, funded thing, but um, uh on the free version, I think that Gemini wins. On the paid for version, um, ChatGPT4 with its data analysis and its ability to do things with PDFs and things like that, I think is uh, really great right now. But let's step back for one second. And I want you guys to realize that Google DeepMind um, is is the reason we have AI. They are the first people to use the transformer technology back uh I believe it was 2017, and I may have the date wrong, but it's because of their transformer technology that we have any of this AI. So I think Google was just being a little more um, cautious about coming out with an AI that we could use. It gave us barred for a minute to get some training, but they've really been in the game forever. So I've been waiting for something like this because I knew there's no way Google is not going to be in this game. And um, I've been waiting for something powerful. So I think we finally now have it. Some of the things that I can do in ChatGPT4, as, uh, like as an example, I can download a spreadsheet, throw it into the prompt, and I can have a conversation with data. I haven't seen the ability to do yet in Google, but does it mean that it's not there? And maybe it came in yesterday and I haven't checked, but... Um, but I think it's coming and I'm really like I so if you want a podcast to listen to, 
there's a podcast called Hard Fork, and it's done by the New York Times guy who got the AI early on, the chat GPT, to hallucinate and tell him he needs to leave his wife and um, all of the things that you might have heard about. And Hard Fork has a uh, interview with the CEO of Google's DeepMind. And it's really, really interesting. And I highly recommend listening to that particular episode because he kind of tells you why they've been a little... Uh, They've been kind of cautious in getting this out and what they are giving you, they feel like they're giving you something safe. Um, any other questions before I move on? Um, somebody asked what about the free version? I don't know if she's referring to- um, Gemini you know, free, I'm yeah. sure. Um, between yeah. the two free versions of Gemini and ChatGPT, I think Gemini is the winner right now. And, mm -hmm. and because of its ability to tell you where those sources came from. Mm -hmm. um, but- Play that fun little game with your your uh with yourself. Like which one ask like four same questions and ask the the uh different models and see what you think. Um okay, so let me head back to this. So um I'm gonna go into uh I'm gonna go into actually I was writing a um I was writing something for Edutopia, and I'm actually going to use this as my example because I want to show you a couple things. So let's say that I'm a kid now, then this is on um, all free Google accounts. And so students have access to this at home in their free Gmail account. And I want you just uh, all of us to know about it. But you'll notice that when I highlight that paragraph and I come over here, I get to uh, this little button. And it will do the tone for me. It can summarize kind of what I've written about. It can bulletize whatever I'm doing, elaborate, shorten. But I love this rephrase. And um, so I can rephrase it and it will come up in this little window. And now I can decide to insert it. I can in decide that I like this better. I'm going to replace it. And I have the ability to rephrase that. Now, I want to say something. I saw someone on Google recently be like, I'm sending this out. They had a blog post and they're like, I didn't use chat GPT for this at all. And um, and probably also Google tools. And I thought to myself, that is not the like flex that you think it is, that you did not use any kind of um, AI to look at your blog post like you did it all on your own. I don't think that's a flex in 2024. It's actually the opposite. The fact you think I would write at well. Do you think I would write a, an article for Edutopia and not have a couple things rephrased or not look at some of the loopholes that Jim and I could tell me like I'm missing some things? I think when people do that right now, I think they're missing the boat. We have a tsunami already coming. Uh, Aaron and I were talking about this yesterday, the superintendent from uh, Michigan. And, um, and I think like it's too late to be like, I didn't use uh, any AI tools. I think that everyone is going to be using them and it would be really, I'd be an idiot not to use that to just check some of the stuff that I've written um, and see how it might be rephrased. So we have that sitting inside of our Google Docs. Inside of slides, we have something similar. I'm gonna go back to slides and just show you a couple tools. Um, and this is sitting in almost every account right now. They're rolling out different things in terms in terms of workspace. Some workspaces are quite advanced and you can look at your drive and get kind of summaries of things that are in there, but that's not on everyone's. It's not even on mine yet. Um, but over here in our slides, I also have the ability, and let me head down here. I have the ability to, um, to have to create an image with Gemini. So if I pull that up, and let me just close that so you can see where I got it. I got it right here with this create an image with Gemini, which is, let me do it again. I'm going to um, kind of circle where this was. It's right here. And most people haven't noticed that that has come up. Some people are all over it and been using it for a while. But here's where I can create an image that I can put into my um to my slide deck. Also using AI, which is not really generative AI, but an AI tool, I can come to this picture that I've uh, put in and they now have this background remover. I, I'm going to say that the background remover is not the greatest uh, right now. I think it's um, new and, and, and whatever. This isn't bad. They did a decent job here. So now I can put this dog in uh, just kind of waiting outside the restaurant. I can make them a little smaller. I guess that's not ratio very good, but um, I have the ability to do certain things like that. These things are just showing up inside of our workspace 
environment. We also have the help me write in our email. I'm not going to go into my email and show you that as um, you all don't want to see what's in my email. But all of these things are just showing up and no one's really announcing them. And um, there's going to start to be a lot more powerful with having things on the side here that let you summarize, look at holes in your arguments, get information straight from Gemini into your slide deck, things like that. Any we questions? Some question yeah, we have some questions coming in, Holly, for sure. Um, so people are asking, some people are saying they're not seeing this. They're asking if they have to add it through an extension. Um, well, I will tell you that I have Gemini, I pay for Gemini uh, workspace. So some of these things, your doc should be there, no matter what, that should even be in your personal account. I don't know if I have these options in my slides because I pay for Gemini workspace. Okay, so John Hill, our, our Google guru, is saying coming soon from Google will be announcements about how Gemini will be part of and involved in terms of student and teacher experience. So this is, I think, all being kind of slowly rolled out. Some of it is the mm -hmm. paid version. Some of it is the mm -hmm. free version. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. and by the way, for myself and my own personal account here on Workspace, I'm paying $16 a month to have these little things in Gemini. I do it mostly so I know what's going on. And when I go to schools, I can actually, you know, show some stuff. But um, uh, so that's how much I'm paying. Uh, and I know with the AI, I would assume on Google's part, and I don't know the answer to this, and I don't think they put anything out on it, but when we're talking about these large language models, there's usually a, um, age limit generally tends to be no one under 13 can use it. If you're over 13, you need parent permission, but we had that same situation with Gmail and things like that. So that becomes, um, probably a discussion that you'll have at your school district, what that looks like. And then what, uh, Google puts out as their age restrictions. Doesn't mean we don't have student facing AI because we do, but when we're using, uh, last thing I think it was, and maybe you guys can correct me, 92% of American schools have, uh, Chromebooks. So that's a lot of kids that will now have, when Google does roll something out, will have access to Gemini at some sort of level, whether it's rephrase or whatever. Um, I know we're already at 1227 and I haven't even getting, gotten to any uh, things. Any other important questions right now? And I'll, and I'll speed through some of this. No, I don't think so. It's all just that people are asking how they can get access to it. Some people are suggesting that maybe the admin needs to do something yeah. with settings to get the it. admin does. So in your admin panel, there is um, apps and the admin needs to uh, give you access to Gemini. Whether or not you can do that at the teacher level, I don't know. I'm doing it on a on a, my own account, which my, mine is sort of an education account because they give that to you when you're a Google innovator. But um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, Gemini for Workspace uh, uh, gives you, um, you can verify those results like we talked about. You can modify, you can do those tone adaptations. It will also give you multiple drafts if you ask it to write something for you. It has the accessibility options of speech to text and then also read, which I think is important when we're talking about the kids in the younger grades, depending on what access is allowed for those kids. Um, you have the ability to save chats like you do in ChatGPT, so you can go back and have that particular window trained on what you're asking for, and then you can share that conversation with the teacher if needed. So um, we have that. I want you all to know that Gemini also lives on your phone and most people don't uh, use this. So um, like in Singapore, like 200 people, I had 200 people in my, my session and 200 people didn't know that this existed. Um, so on your phone, you've got to download this Google app instead of like Chrome or Safari and Safari automatically is the thing that's used on your iPhone as an example. So once you download this Google app, then you're going to have this thing that comes up. And this is what I use all the time um, that has the search, but also over in the right hand corner. And I'm sorry, I'm going in between windows, so I'm not putting this in full screen mode. And, and maybe I should, but um, you'll see a little Gemini thing there. Uh, and it's like a little star, I guess, is what you want to call it. And once I click on that, then I get access to Gemini in my phone. And um, and I think that's pretty solid, like to have it right there in your phone. So know that that's there and that you have to access it through that Google app that most many people don't have. And our key considerations in when we're looking at what is this going to look like in schools is we need to look at the data privacy portion of whatever AI is coming out. 
We also need to put expectations on teachers. So I've seen some really forward thinking policy that says, you know what, teachers, we expect that you're going to use AI. We expect, and this is what the school is saying in their AI policy. We expect the use of AI. We expect you to mentor, use it in your class. And, and that's just the thing. Their AI is coming. Kids are going to have to be able to use it for their jobs. And you're not going to be able to close your classroom down and be like, no, every kid's writing by hand in here. There are school districts who say flat out, we're not accepting that. And I think that's a very forward thinking way of looking at it. And also, I totally think that's how people should be looking at it. We should be telling teachers, you've got to learn how to use these AI tools. Um, Google had its 25th birthday uh, last year. And, and it made me think when I saw it was the 25th birthday, I thought to myself, I think of those teachers that I work with at school districts who are like, yeah, I'm not really tech savvy. And I thought to myself, was 25 years not enough? Like, how much time do we need to catch up with the technology? And I think with AI, there's not going to be that 25 year grace period. Um, so it's something to consider. Also, um, giving expectations to students that you, if you use it, here's what we expect. And I'm going to give you a great example of that in a second. Um, I've done a lot of parent nights. I think that's super important where I talk to the parents in the community about AI because they have the wrong idea of what it's going to do. And like at one school, we were using a student facing AI and I didn't want the kids to go home and be like, we're using AI. And then they're in third grade and the parents to be like, you're on chat GBT because that's all they know. So those parent nights are super important. Modeling in classrooms are super important and telling teachers that we've got to do this in our class. If we have a question about the novel, let's not try and dissect it ourselves every time. Let's yes and that and let's ask the AI for the answer to that question. And then creating an AI policy that's fluid, that's not going to be something that we put out and that's it, that is changing and adapting as the times change and adapt. Um, so uh, this is kind of the stuff that I'm doing at schools uh, by getting uh, schools ready with resources, with targeted PD, with best practice ideas, showcases of what works, um, showing the, showing how pedagogy plays a role in this, making sure the community is on board. And by the community, I mean the, the um, parents for sure, the students are part of that voice and that the teachers, and especially the ones who are a little bit reluctant, really have the opportunity to see why reluctance is not an option kind of thing. I'm going to say that because you all are here and you, you obviously are AI pioneers. Um, giving some ethical guidelines and some instructional design. And the instructional design is the, the next step. Like I was saying that the superintendent, Aaron, is here. That's something we're looking at at his school, like this instructional design, the next steps of putting the pedagogy with it. Because his teachers are using AI, his wife using AI at her school. So like, where do we go next? Um, and then um, uh, inside of, and, and we're gonna give you this slide deck, but um, uh, Google has some AI tools for educators, a, a website, and I've clicked on these or I've linked these. And one of these has um, Teach AI. And many of you have heard of this, but Teach AI has some great uh, resources. So when we're talking about those resources, this particular, um, site has some of the best resources for things that you can do as a leader to really get your school ready. So you're going to want to peruse this site. Um, I'm trying to go fast really quick because I know. Yeah, but can I pause for a second right there? Yeah. Allie? I just think that that's so important when you're, you know, we keep hearing we need to teach about, you know, the ethics and the bias of all and all of that. But then people are like, well, yeah, that, that does sound very important. But where do I even start? How do I do mm -hmm. that? Where do I get the resources to do that? And, so, you know, and those just, are here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And free and right there and yeah. easily accessible. Google has done a really good job of this. Another resource is UNESCO, which is UN's um, education leg. And they have a whole thing called um, K-12 curricula. It's 168 pages. But if you are in charge of AI at your school, you really need to be familiar with that document. So these are kind of like the trifecta for me of the documents with Google leading uh, the way, quite frankly, ChatGPT is not really paying attention to education. So this is where Google, I think, is going to make its um, stride. So when we talk about that misinformation and that bias, Gemini provides us the opportunity to see where stuff comes from. And a simple thing that you can do uh, is you can ask um, when you're using AI, 
let's say I asked about what are the top three things that Martin Luther King Jr. did in his lifetime. After I'm done, I can ask, could the information you provided have bias or misinformation? And the AI will come back and evaluate its response. That's something we can't do in a simple Google search. By the way, Google searches are going to be transforming more into an AI search that hasn't rolled out yet, but it will soon. And um, so just remembering that if we teach kids to, from the get-go, always ask, could this information um, have misinformation or bias, but uh, using Gemini to look at those resources can be really good. Um, I'm going to just quickly, uh, sorry, um, I'm just going to quickly say something about AI detectors, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, be, uh, but AI detectors like turnitin.com don't work. Um, it's actually a technology that doesn't exist, and I, I kind of think it's a money grab. I think that they're lying, and they've actually been caught lying on their research. Um, and so, AI detectors are not our AI kind of policy and teachers who are still using those need to move away from those because they are super problematic for kids and saying I'm going to give a kid a zero if they've used AI. That's like near impossible now. Um, so we have stuff that we can do like this. I'm going to come over to that writing. I'm going to get out of this and discard it. And I have set in my um, Chrome extension, and we have this in this particular slide deck, I have something called Brisk Teaching. And it's a Chrome extension that if I install it, and a lot of people have used this, I'm a huge fan. Um, if uh, I have to reload it, that's great. <laughs> Let me come over here really quickly, because maybe I don't, mm, I don't know if I can take the time to reload it. But what it will do is it has this, um, button that will come up that says replay and it will replay every time the kid was in this document when they pasted when they were just editing it and I can see whether or not the kid is bringing in AI and cut and pasting it in and I can actually watch as the paper is being written so I know if a kid copied and pasted something from Gemini or ChatGPT I'm going to know so Brisk Teaching is a very great Chrome extension to do and let me just see I don't know how I reload, but let me just reload this page and see if it's as simple as that. I don't think so. Uh, let me go to brisk. And I'm hitting brisk in my Chrome extension and nothing's happening. It should be showing up down here. So I apologize. These things happen. Um, happens to the best of us. So finally, um, that's sort of my answer for AI detectors. And um, I think it should be one of the tools that is in your disposal. It also offers feedback. And then I'm not going to go into this uh, Notebooks LM, but I, you have the link and Notebooks LM is a way for students to take notes and then ask AI questions about those notes that they've taken from resources that they've put in their notebook. It's quite um, a great tool, but we're sort of getting a little past time as normal. I always think I don't have enough <laughs> and that's never the case. And so I'm gonna pass it over to you, Anna, and let you talk about some of those other ones. I'm gonna oh, stop you? sharing. I, yeah. you know, Holly, I only need about five minutes if you wanted to get into any of yours, but I can, um, I can take it over if you'd like me to. Yeah, take it over. And then okay. um, if we have time and people want me to show that notebooks LM. I'm happy to do it. It's the sure. more important is knowing that this Gemini has the ability to uh, validate that information, that it's going to be showing up in everything. And I think that's the most important part. Sure. Okay. Yep. Well, I wanted to just touch on a couple of my, uh, a couple underrated features. I feel like, you know, I think a lot of people have heard of Google Arts and Culture. It's been around for quite a while, but I just feel like it's very underutilized. You know, just imagine it's a giant online museum with free admission, open 24 seven, just filled with, you know, everything you can imagine from around the world. And there's, you know, a famous artwork, historical artifacts, tours of museums. This is completely free. Um, it's recommended for ages 12 and up if you're looking into that, but you just go to artsandculture.google.com and it's linked on our slide deck. And so if you've cool. been in here, they have really updated a lot of things. This main page is always different. It changes every day. You slide down, they have all these different articles and you know anything you can imagine. But I want to take you through these tabs up here really quickly. Um, this explore link has these highlights and right in here are some of Google Arts and Culture experiments, which we're going to look at here in a minute. And most of those are chock full of AI. 
Um, there's also videos that has these different categories. In this play feature, this is what I wanted to show you. Um, this has some of those experiments, activities as well. One of my favorites right now that I've been playing with is this musical canvas. And basically you can go in here and you can draw, you know, just doodle, sketch a little picture, maybe, you know, have students go in after they're reading um, a novel or learning about some sort of historical event or really just even, you know, a mindfulness activity, you know, just kind of use the colors or sketch something how you're feeling. So you can put anything in there, make it really basic. You know, I tried this earlier, I just did a heart and then I kind of did like a little broken heart in there just to see what it would do. And they can take as much time as they want, but you don't have to be a Rembrandt in here or anything. And then all you do is you click the generate music and this little guy down here is going to start telling you what he thinks about your picture. You know, he's as he's oh. giving you these thought bubbles, he's telling you what he's thinking, how he's feeling looking at this. Oh. And he's going to generate AI created music. Can you hear that? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, he realizes it's a broken heart. It's going to create a sense of sadness and longing. So it's just a really neat feature, I think, that, you know, incorporates music. It incorporates artwork, it incorporates feelings, you know, just a whole lot of different aspects that, you know, it's, it's just kind of a good brain break, if anything else, for students. So I thought that was kind of a neat feature in here now as well. And there are a lot of different activities in here that are fun to play around with. There's a bunch of different filters and things that you can do with your camera as well. You can put your own face in famous paintings. So it's just a lot of fun things. Um, this tab up here is the nearby one. This shows you the museums and exhibitions uh, near you, anything that has to do with art or culture. I'm in the smack dab in the middle of Illinois, so there's actually a surprising amount of culture around me that you might not expect. You know, I'm about two hours south of Chicago, so here's <laughs> the Art Institute of Chicago. I have to travel 129 miles to get there, but I only have to go about 11 miles up to Bloomington, Illinois to get to the McLean County Museum of History. So that's neat that it shows you that it has those different things nearby. And then in here, I've got these favorites that I've linked. You can go through here. You can search using the search bar for relevant topics. One I was looking at the other day, I was finding topics on the eclipse and going in and you know, just finding a lot of resources having to do with that and different topics. But there are several different AI things integrated in here. In the search bar, if you type in AI, it will bring up everything that has AI from the articles and the topics and the collections. And down here are the experiments, which are the ones that you can actually interact with. And there's 14 different experiments in here. And they're so cool. Isn't that neat? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any questions about that? I see. Good. Nothing in the chat. Okay, perfect. And then another one we have here really quickly is Google Labs. This is a really neat experimental area. You can, if you go to Google Labs, they're going to prompt you to sign up if you're willing to be an early adopter or an early experimenter with some programs that they're working on, whether they're deciding that they're going to want to, you know, push them out to the masses or not. And this has, you know, some that you click on and you have to sign up to get access to it, but some of them you can just click on and get right in and play with them. This one is kind of a cool one. This is Stay What You See. Um, you know, I know you were talking about prompt engineering earlier, Holly, and how that's not going to be quite as much of a thing. But this is kind of neat for teachers um, where it does work on prompt engineering, but it also works on descriptive language. You know, yeah. so it gives you a picture and it says, say what you see. And it's going to give me a percentage of how well I do. I only have 120 characters to type. But, you know, I might say if I just said something really simple like a brown horse. Okay, that was not very, I didn't use a lot of descriptive language for that, did I? So this little brain is thinking, he's like, no, 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 you didn't do so great. That's only a 39% match. Down here, he's giving me a tip saying, include more information about the context. Is the horse running, standing still, or being ridden? So I could try again, and I could say, a wooden brown horse 
facing the side with its front left leg raised and see if I do any better with that. And he's thinking down here, oh, I got a check mark. It's a 66% match. That doesn't quite look like what that is. So I could try again if I wanted to, but this is a cool little feature. I can search this topic. If something comes up that really piques my interest, I can go in and find these different articles and these different pieces of artwork and get in there and find some more information about it back at Google Arts and Culture after I have worked on describing what it is. That's so that's, that's a fun little experiment. Oh, is somebody talking? Yeah, I was just gonna come. Cammy left a comment that about say what you see that it's a great, it's great to get students starting with prompting. So it's just, which I think is- Yes. Like yeah, it is great to get them started with prompting. And then that can take you here to this image FX, which is similar to kind of the image creator on Gemini and other places, but I just like that it's right here. It's really easy to use. Um, I've used this with people as, you know, you can, you can use this to spark discussion about creating visuals for time travel or book reports, um, creating characters. I would like to use this for icebreakers. You know, I actually got this idea from Carl Hooker at one of his sessions and he said, you know, name an animal and one of your favorite hobbies, your favorite food at your favorite place. So I might say a sloth eating tacos and write and reading a book at the beach. And then it's gonna generate a couple of images for me. So this is just a really good thing to get conversation started, get, you know, break the ice a little bit. Again, getting into that descriptive language, using students' imaginations. We're gonna see what it generates here. While that's loading, Victoria asks, um, is Google Arts and Culture available for free to students? Yep. Yes. Yep, it's available for free to everybody. And you don't have to put in any private information or anything. You just go to the website and get right in. So I like this one. You know, I could download it. And then a thing that Carl Hooker had everybody do is they downloaded their image that best described them. And then they, up, then they put it on a Canva document anonymously. So everybody kind of had to guess what what was that representing, you know? So mine, obviously, you know what it was. It's a sloth on the beach with a taco. But there were just some really funny ones that were generated based on the different hobbies and foods and places that people like to be. And then it's fun to kind of guess who created what. And it's just, you know, just a neat activity. This is just a different image generator that's easy to get to. Again, you don't have to put any personal information in. And it does a pretty good job with Anna. Yeah. Can I say so with students, and I've done this with the younger grades, um, though it could be done with older grades. Once I do an activity like this, I then have them start to think about what creates a better AI image. And mm -hmm. then they create an algorithm in which um, they say the steps you need to do to make that uh, image the best it can be. Like a uh, type of image might be the first step in your algorithm. Um, a, a noun might be the second step and it gets them really thinking about that prompt engineering, although whatever we'll call it in the future. Right. And it also gets them understanding what creates an algorithm. And then they start to kind of make on their own the jump to this is how we make good sentences too. Mm -hmm. This is how we do good writing. And it's really uh, it's an awe-inspiring activity. Well, because it's so tangible, you know, if they're not detailed with it, they're not going to get what they're envisioning. They're not getting what they want. Like, no, that's not what I meant. Well, what did you mean? You you know, you have to tell it. It, it. It's not a mind reader. So, you know, and this is pretty cool too, because I like that it has these drop-down boxes that you can yep. change different things. It gives you some different suggestions that you can play around with it mm -hmm. as well, which I haven't seen that other places. I think that's kind of a neat feature as well. Really yeah. So it takes a minute for it to generate though. And then, yeah, you can share them. You can download it straight to your computer. Okay. So here's a sloth eating burgers and playing video games. And I don't really see a video prompt. game there, yeah. but there it's playing a video game. It has the controller. So, but that's the kind of stuff I want us to think about in education. Like that's a fun activity. Where do we go with the pedagogy of it? And that's where we bring in the students really dissecting what are those things that they have in those drop down venues and, and keep going so that they become better image creators and in prompters. Right. I love it. Yeah. Those two little quick things were, you know, was 
was, was my little part that I was going to show. Did you have anything else that you wanted to go back and show before we wrapped it up, Holly? Well, no, but like you started with, oh, mine are kind of these little known things or whatever, and they were both amazing. So <laughs> you knocked it out of the ballpark. I love They're them. Fun. Thank you. Um, I was looking at the comments while you were speaking and I, I could have misunderstood something. So I just want to make sure that I um, am not misunderstanding it. So I want to make sure that I say again about AI detectors, the technology to tell you if something was written by AI does not exist. So if you think there's an AI detector out there or a way that we can find out or students can trick us about it. That's the wrong kind of um, way to be thinking about it. And with things like Brisk, I tried to redo Brisk to make it work and it, there's, it's not working right now. I'm sure they're thrilled by that. But um, but that's just because I probably need to restart my window, whatever. But, um, but we need to be with replay and with um, uh, revision history. We can see where students did things and it tells us at the top how many pace there are, how many edits, and there's a third one and I can't remember what it is right now. But now I need to have a conversation with students. Why are there 22 pace in here? Can you explain that to me? And rather than saying, hey, I caught you, whatever, we're now opening up conversations with students so that why are there so many pace? Because I was doing this one for Edutopia and what I would have showed you is it has 42 pace. And a teacher could be like, well, you pasted a bunch of times, you had to have used AI. But the truth is, when I started that document for Edutopia, I was going a different way. And then I started to think about it differently. So I had written in this other document a bunch of stuff that I eventually brought over to the second document and I was pasting from there. And I think having and giving students um, an opportunity to talk about that is so important. We have students right now, uh, one student who's most famous for this at the University of Georgia, or maybe it's Georgia Tech. She uh, she turned in something. Her her teacher put it through an AI detector. It said it had been written forty or fifty percent by AI, and she actually got a bad grade and lost her scholarship. And um, she had not used AI. She did use Grammarly before Grammarly was using generative AI in it. And so um, I'm really trying to, and as I always have, kind of be the voice for students and learning. And rather than gotcha, we need to really say. Okay, if you used AI, how was it used? Uh, what things did you like about using it rather than um, than this gotcha thing? And I want to show you one thing that they're doing in Shanghai really quickly, and then I'm done talking and we can go to questions and all the other stuff that we need to do. But um, so I was working in um, in uh, a school in Hong Kong and uh, I was doing a session and one of the people there, his name is Alex McMillan. You can follow him because we're going to give you this. In fact, I'll put this slide deck into the... In, Maybe someone already has, but I'll give you the link in the um, chat. But he created this, and it's all over the Shanghai American School, that kids need to do this when they're working with AI. They need to stick to the tape. And it was, you know, we were trying to come up, kind of talked about this at this session, and then he went forward and did it all. But um, you need to stick to the tape and being transparent about when you used AI, um, making sure that the AI you used was accurate. This is where Gemini is a great resource, because you can go look at those um whether the answers where they came from, you need to talk about the process. Did you use it for idea generation? Did you use it to uh, do this one paragraph over and over? And then really sticking to the expectations of your teacher. And these expectations could be that the teacher says on this assignment, I don't want you using AI or on or I'm OK with you using it in these ways or use it as much as you want. But just talk to me about the ways you used it. So as we go more into thinking about AI in this way, then I think we're not going to need those AI detectors. But there are many, many departments of education being sued over the use of um, things like turnitin.com. So not only is it problematic because it doesn't exist, people are being sued and teachers actually have been sued. So I'm done now. <laughs> and I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you so much, Holly. I'm going to share. Well, we're going to get this slide up one more time. Uh, okay, here we go. Share. Okay, great. Yeah. So thank you again, Holly. And for everyone who has never met us, Trefera, before, we're so glad and honored that you would have spent the past hour with us. I know we came for Holly, but it was just great to meet all of you so much. Trefera, we are a reseller of uh, educational te technologies, so Chromebooks, IFPs, really anything that's in the classroom to support teaching and learning, we partner with schools to get that in front of them. And we also work really hard with the schools that we partner with 
to help them transform the way that they're teaching with that technology. And we do that through a couple of different things like professional development, ready-made lesson plans, online learning courses and things like that to give teachers the confidence to transform their instructional practice with technology. So we haven't met before, an honor, absolute honor to meet you. One thing just to kind of wrap it up, we've talked about a whole bunch of different AI tools and there are all sorts, I mean, we, we even saw half a dozen different types of AI tools. And there are more features than we were evil, even able to talk about in Google Workspace for Education. I know there were a couple of questions in the chat and we'd be happy to point you in the right direction afterwards if you have more questions on that. But we do have a super exciting promo going on right now. If you want to try out the enhanced version of Google Workspace for Education, so that's the teaching and learning upgrade, the plus education standard, you can get a 60 day free trial if you follow the link in that QR code or go to trafera.com forward slash Google Workspace for Education. On top of that, just the free trial, we are doing a giveaway for people who are signing up for that demo. So you, if you do sign up for the demo, you can enter to win a $100 gift card. So make sure you take advantage of that. It's a super exciting way to try out some more of these AI tools that are in the advanced version, enhanced versions of Google Workspace. Sorry, I'm trying to say things super fast, so I'm tripping over my own tongue. I'm going to launch the exit survey now while we say goodbye. And again, this is just a reminder. This exit survey is our your way of kind of raising your hand and saying, hey, I want that coffee gift card. So please make sure you take that before you leave. But that really concludes the session today. And I just want to, I'm going to go through the chat one more time to make sure we don't have any questions that didn't get hit. But I wanted to say a very wholehearted thank you to Holly for being here. It was so much fun and just an absolute treat to get to get your expertise on AI. And Anna, thank you for being here. But most importantly, thank you everyone who joined in. It's, it's great to have you. Yeah. Thank you for participating in the chat. It was so much fun seeing all the questions and comments and all of your tips. We had a great time. So make sure you, uh, I will also put in the chat, we've got some exciting webinars. We have an exciting webinar coming up a month from now with Eric Kurtz. If you're interested in That's good. talking more googly stuff, we're going to be talking about accessibility tips within Chromebooks. So I will put a link in the chat quick so you can register for that one. It's going to be another super great session that we are excited for. Anna, Holly, any closing thoughts here? No, just thank you, Holly, so much for being here. It was just an absolute pleasure and honor doing this with you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, and I want to say Eric gives a great session, so it's a good one. So make mm -hmm. sure to register for that one next month. All right, it's in the chat. Well, with that, we'll <laughs> I will leave the the poll Bye, up Karen. a little bit right. so you can finalize your responses. But thank you again, and have a great rest of your week. <laughs>